Good morning, everybody. We're going to get started with, uh, oh, good morning. We're going to get started with um, our material today. We need to finish up chapter 9, and then we have a few sections of chapter 11 that we're going to go over. We're not going to be too heavy on the practice problems for chapter 11, but we will focus on those next week. So I'm hoping to get through all of the material and then we'll do practice problems next week to prepare you for your exam. I will still post a chapter 11 recorded YouTube video lecture style. Obviously that didn't happen um, because over the weekend I was doing something else. So, um, but you will get that um, and that will help you as well. So don't worry, chapter 11 is on the way. Are there any questions for me before we get started in terms of logistics about, you know, exam stuff or anything like that? This would be a good time to ask. Okay, go for it. Yes. Yes. So as long as we get through everything for chapter 11, then it'll still be due. If we don't, or if you guys are like, mm, this is a little struggle, then we can adjust it. I don't want it. I don't want to be evil. We've got some time. But I do encourage you to work on it before your exam so that you can see, you know, what areas you need some help in. Fair? Okay. Other questions? Or you can let me know that you're ready to go. Okie dokie. Then let's go. Last week we left off with concentrations. So we were doing calculations with molarity. We did mass by mass, mass by volume, and all these other ways to calculate concentrations of solutions. What we're picking up is dilutions and solute concentrations. So if you have a concentrated stock of a solution, you can take some of that and dilute it down with water and make a more dilute, you know, working solution of sorts. So we're going to talk about how to do those calculations. So in your initial and diluted solutions, which initial, you might also see that as concentrated stock. If you're like working in a lab or something like that, it may be called that. If you take 10 milliliters, let's say, of your initial solution, which I abbreviate S-O-L-N, solution, and you add it into a flask here. It's still going to have the same number of moles of solute, whether it's 10 milliliters of the initial solution in its own bottle, or you take 10 milliliters out and put it into a new flask, right? So the number of moles of solute are the same. But then you add some water to make your diluted solution. Now we've got a different concentration, but the same number of moles. And we can calculate the concentration of the diluted solution or our initial stock, provided that we have volumes in at least one concentration. So if we have a concentration, let's say, in molarity times a volume in liters, and we have another molarity times the volume in liters. Well, what's molarity? Molarity is equal to moles over liters.
that's going to leave you with moles. So the equation that we have C1, V1, where C is the concentration and V is the volume, what we're saying is the number of moles of the solute from the concentrated stock or our initial solution is the same as the diluted solution. That's why this equation works. So does everybody understand kind of, we're gonna do a practice problem just to make sure you understand how it works. We're doing, uh, we'll do a couple of them. But do you understand kind of the basics of, okay, to make a dilution, we're taking some amount of a concentrated solution, watering it down, still the same number of moles, and we can do some math to figure out concentrations. That's kind of the summary of this slide. So are we good here? So let's do some examples. I, I think talking about equations without doing some real math doesn't make sense. So what volume of a 2% mass by volume HCl solution can be prepared by diluting 25 milliliters of 14% mass by volume HCl solution. So I'll kind of walk you through this one and then I have another one for you to try. So whenever you see something about diluting, dilution, that clues you in that you're going to be using this equation whenever you're talking about dilutions. The next step is to assign your variables. So what's C1, what's V1, and all that, and then figure out which one of the variables are you trying to find. So we have what volume of a 2% mass by volume HCl solution. This is telling us about the dilution. So that concentration is C2. Can be prepared by diluting 25 milliliters of 14% mass by volume solution. So this is our initial stock. So we place our volume for V1 and our concentration for C1. We don't know what the volume is. That's what we're trying to find. The key to these problems is making sure that your concentrations are the same unit and your volumes are the same unit. So here you have to make sure, okay, we've got mass by volume for both of them, so that's fine for concentration. And we've got milliliters for our volume, so that means when we solve this, our answer is going to be in milliliters. One of the places you also want to be careful is when reporting your answer, make sure that you're reporting it in the units that the question is asking for. Yes, go for it, Jordan. Concentration, you're welcome. So you make sure that you give your answer in the units that the question is asking for. Here it's not specified, but I could have said what volume in liters, and, that, and then you'd have to convert your answer to liters at the end. So make sure that you read and you pay attention to your units. That's really the only tricky part here. So now that we've got all this, we need to solve for V2. And just like with the gas laws, when I'm solving for a variable, I like to remind myself what it is I'm trying to isolate. So here, I'm trying to isolate V2, figure out that final volume. That means I'm going to divide both sides by C2. 
Does everybody see that? So we rewrite our equation, and then we fill in the numbers. You can go ahead and do this on your own. You can put in, put your answer in the chat. Put it into your calculator and let me know what you get. Exactly. We get 175 milliliters. What if I asked you for the volume in liters? Then what would your answer be? If I wanted not milliliters, but liters? Yes. So just remember again, for your homework and for the exam, Give your answer for the volume or the concentration in the units that are specified. You guys ready to try your own problem? All right, let's do it. So here you've got molarity. What's the molarity of a solution prepared by diluting 0 0.180 liters of a 0 0.600 molar uh, nitric acid solution to 0.540 liters. You can put your answer in the chat. I'll check in in two minutes. You can keep on working. I'm going to set up the problem. There's our equation because we're doing a dilution. Yes, go for it. Um, so we didn't get this far last week. But, yeah. So it's in the YouTube pre-recorded lecture, but we didn't get to it in class. So we're finishing up Chapter 9. Yeah. You're welcome. Alrighty, so this time we're solving for C2. So I agree with you guys who put your answer in the chat. You should get 0 .200 molar. We got to add the zeros because we need three significant figures. Questions or are we good? We'll move on to the last section of chapter nine, which is properties of solutions. So we are gonna talk about solutions, colloids, and suspensions. I'll give you the characteristics of each. You'll need to be able to, you know, in a multiple choice question, decide, oh, okay, this is describing a solution or a colloid or a suspension. 
So solutions are transparent. They do not separate. And they have very small particles or ions or molecules that you can't filter and they will pass through a semi-permeable membrane. So there's really nothing that you can do in terms of filtering that will get rid of the solute in a solution, okay? Transparent doesn't mean that it can't have a color. So it could be blue or green or something like that. It just means that you can see through it. Colloids have medium-sized particles. You can't filter them, but you can separate them by a semi-permeable membrane. One example of a colloid that you may have played with um, in elementary school is cornstarch and water. So it has like this kind of goopy feeling and um, it will sort of separate out, but not really. It's really, it's still in solution. It's, it's kind of a fun thing for little kids. And then the last one is suspensions. So they're heterogeneous, which means that they're non-uniform mixtures. They have very large particles that will settle out of solution. You can filter them with just regular old filter paper and they have to be stirred up to stay suspended. Some examples are blood platelets. So if you've ever um, given blood, muddy water and calamine lotion. So if you've ever had chicken pox or if you've had a run in with po poison oak or poison ivy, you're familiar with calamine lotion. So that's solutions, colloids, and suspensions. So I know we just ran through that a little bit quick. Yeah. Does molarity need to be solved with liters? Yes, it does. Molarity is defined as moles divided by liters. So because of what molarity is, you have to use liters as your volume. Not milliliters liters. Does that answer your question? Okay, good. Yeah, if you ever have a throwback question, just put it in the chat and I may finish my, um, my train of thought and then I'll get to your question. So don't feel like, oh, we passed it. So now I can't ask. Not true. All right. So here's a quick learning check. A mixture that has solute particles that do not settle out but are too large to pass through a semi-permeable membrane is called a, and we just went through these, so you can put your answer in the chat. I can go back through if you need me to. So the key here is that the particles do not settle out of solution. That's going to be a colloid. So we just went through that really quickly. Make sure that you know those three solution, colloid, and suspension, and you'll be fine. Okay. We've been talking a lot about solutions, doing calculations. We've also talked about electrolytes and how, you know, if something dissolves in water, then you're making all these different ions and things like that. When a solute is added to water, you're changing the properties of the water. So the vapor pressure changes, the boiling point of the solution changes, and so does the freezing point. These properties are called colligative properties and they depend on the concentration of solute in solution. Not the identity, just the concentration. So it could be sodium chloride, it could be calcium chloride, it could be any number of ionic compounds that you're dissolving in water. You could be adding sugar, you know, table sugar, that's a molecule. Anything that you're dissolving in water is going to change 
all of these colligative properties. We're going to do some calculations to show how freezing point gets lowered and the boiling point is elevated. So I talked about that in the Chapter 9 YouTube recorded video. I'm not going to go over those concepts, but I do want to go over the math for how to calculate it because I think that's a little bit trickier. If you do have questions about the concept, feel free to ask or come to office hours, send me a message, that kind of thing. Okay. Just take my word for it if you didn't get a chance to watch the YouTube video that if you add a salt or any kind of molecule to water and you try to freeze it, the freezing point is going to be lower than just pure water. And we can calculate that. I did this example in the YouTube video, but I'm going to do it here too. And then we're going to do one for boiling point elevation. So I am from the Northeast. I'm very familiar with highways being icy and salt or lack thereof. So this question is near and dear to my heart. Calcium chloride is spread on icy highways to melt the ice. Calculate the freezing point of a solution containing 0 0.50 moles of calcium chloride in one kilogram of water. As a refresher, calcium chloride is an ionic compound. It is a strong electrolyte, meaning that it will fully dissociate in water. So this is one of those dissociation equations that you had to that you have to practice writing for chapter 9. When we add water to calcium chloride, we make calcium ions and chloride ions. There's a two sub uh, a two coefficient here because there's a subscript of 2 in calcium chloride. So that's what happens when you add that to water. We care about this because we need to figure out how many particles we're making, how many moles of particles we're making, because that's going to affect our freezing point. So for every one mole of calcium chloride, we're making three moles of particles. That's one mole of calcium ions plus two moles of the chloride ions. Does everybody understand that? To go from calcium chloride to number of moles of particles. Okay, because this is key. If you'll notice, this is an equality, which means we can write a unit factor from it, and we're going to need to in just a minute. The other piece of information that you will need to solve this problem, which is in the YouTube video, is that for water, when we're talking about freezing point depression, you're going to drop your freezing point by 1.86 degrees Celsius for every one mole of particles that you add to water. This is specifically for water. So that's information you will receive if you're given this question on an exam. Now we're going to put together an equation. Since this property, freezing point, is reliant simply on how many moles of particles, we need to figure out how many moles of particles we have. Well, 
we're starting with half a mole of calcium chloride. We can write a conversion factor from this equality to figure out how many moles of particles that translates to. And then from there, we can use our conversion factor to figure out how many degrees of change we have. So this is calculating our change in the temperature, or our change in the freezing point. So when you do that, you get 2.8 degrees Celsius. But that's not it. The freezing point of water is zero degrees Celsius. That's where we're starting. Then we're going to lower it, right? So that means that our new freezing point is going to take our old freezing point of zero degrees Celsius and subtract our change in temperature. So this negative 2.8 degrees Celsius is our new freezing point. Now I have another example for you to do that's boiling point. Let me know if this makes sense and you want to try the boiling point one or if you need me to break this down again. So hit me with your questions or let me know if you're ready to move on. Okay, so keep this example in mind. Now we're gonna do boiling point. So the number is a little bit different for the, um, for the change in temperature. Again, this is specifically for water. The boiling point of water is 100 degrees Celsius. So when you're calculating boiling point elevation, you add your change in temperature to the boiling point. So I'm going to give you two minutes to try to get started, and then I'll come in and solve it. And I'll write that tip as well, that you need to add your change in temperature to the boiling point. I'll check back in two minutes. I'll go ahead and set up the problem. Feel free to put your answer in the chat if you get one. Or let me know if you get stuck. I'm going to start by writing out how sodium chloride dissociates in water. That way we'll know how many particles. No, so for this one, we have sodium chloride. So you have to figure out how many particles. When it dissolves, you have sodium ions and chloride ions. We only have two moles of particles for every one mole of sodium chloride. Add, don't subtract. Boiling point elevation, which means that it's going to be higher than normal. So add what you got to 100 degrees, and then you'll have it, Ayana.
So when you do that math, you should get 0.51 degrees Celsius for your temperature change. For your new boiling point, it's a boiling point elevation. So you take the normal boiling point of water, which is 100 degrees Celsius, and you add your delta T. Jordan, you have a question. Go for it. So you have to figure out how sodium chloride dissociates. So if you you have to go back to the writing the how the strong electrolytes dissociate in water. So you write that out and then you can figure out how many particles you have total. So you've got one mole of sodium of sodium ions <clears throat> and one mole of the chloride ions. So that means two moles total. That's something that you would be told. You're welcome. So that value is just for water. When you have one mole of particles added to water, you're going to elevate the boiling point by half a degree Celsius. So it's the same thing, except you're adding your delta T instead of subtracting, like you do for your freezing point. Other questions? All right, then we're going to keep moving ahead. The next topic we're going to cover is osmosis. And then we're also going to talk about kind of bringing osmosis to a more biologically relevant system, our bodies. So in osmosis, water will flow from where you have a higher solute from a lower to a higher solute concentration. So let's say that we've got a sugar solution on one side of a membrane and you just got plain water on the other. You're going to have flow of water from the pure water side to the sugar water side until the concentrations are the same on both sides. So you're trying to dilute down that sugar solution so that it is a lower concentration and at the same time you may have some of that sucrose migrating over to the water side to balance things out. But the take home here is to know that the water is going to flow if you have the lower concentration of solute to a higher concentration of solute. So that's osmosis. We care about osmosis because our bodies are, I mean, we've got all kinds of solutions, right? And we have membranes. Our cells are surrounded by membranes. That's what keeps all the goodies inside. And those membranes are selective. They let certain things in, they let certain things out. They're an example of a semi-permeable membrane. So osmosis is something that's constantly going on. When you think about blood, tissue fluids, lymph, all these other things, they have specific concentrations of different solutes. If you've ever gone to the hospital or you've seen any of those hospital TV shows, you are familiar with an IV. So intravenous solutions, they you know, put a needle in and then they can run solution directly to your bloodstream to give you medication, to hydrate you, what have you. The IV solutions that they use are what's called isotonic solutions, which means since it's going directly into your bloodstream, it's going to have the same concentration 
of sugar or salt or some other solute in your blood as your blood does because you don't want to do anything to cause your blood cells to swell or shrink and we'll talk about that in a minute so isotonic solution remember that that means same so it's the same concentration as something else. That's ISO means same. For our blood cells in the blood, with an IV, we're talking about 5% mass by volume glucose or 0.9% mass by volume sodium chloride. Remember those numbers because there will be questions on the exam regarding isotonic, hypertonic, hypotonic, which we're going to talk about. So make sure to make a note about what isotonic solution is regarding glucose and sodium chloride and the blood. So I'll give you a second to jot that down, or if you're going to go back and print off the notes, make sure you highlight that part. So are we good so far? We covered osmosis and isotonic solutions. Go for it. What's your question? Sodium chloride. So both of the things that I underlined here. And I'm going to try to be fancy on y'all. Look at this. I can highlight. So know that. So why do we care about that? Well, if osmosis is going on constantly in our bodies because we, we're constantly taking in things, we've got metals, sugars, salts, all these things going in, you know, in our bloodstream and in coming in contact with our tissues. Anytime we have a solution that has a concentration that's higher or lower than what we have in our blood, that's going to affect our blood cells. In an isotonic solution, you're still going to have water exchange, but you're not going to have, you know, water flowing more from the outside to the inside or the inside to the outside. Everything is happy. Your red blood cells are normal. In a hypotonic solution, what that means is the concentration of glucose or NaCl is lower than in your blood. We'll say in the blood cells. So those numbers I told you, the 5% mass by volume glucose and the 0.90% sodium chloride. If we have something that's say 4% mass by volume glucose, that's a hypotonic solution. The concentration of glucose is lower than what's in your blood cells. In that scenario, you're going to have more water flowing into the red blood cell. And if you see here, it's very subtle but the length of the arrows are different. The length of the arrow of the water going into the cell, and I'll exaggerate it here, is bigger than the one for the flow of water coming out. If that happens, your red blood cells will swell, and that's what's called hemolysis. Eventually they'll burst, they'll swell and burst. That's bad. We don't want our blood cells swelling and bursting. The other scenario is our blood cells being in a hypertonic solution. That means the concentration of glucose or sodium chloride is higher than in our blood cells. And again, this is referencing IV fluid, okay?
So one example would be 7% mass by volume glucose. That's much higher than 5%. In that case, we're going to have the red blood cell pushing water out and very little water going into the cell. The cell is going to shrink. It's going to take on this really weird shape. And that's very bad. That shrinking is called crenation. You'll want to know these three different scenarios and identify if I have a solution of this concentration of glucose or sodium chloride, will a red blood cell, you know, swell and burst? Will it shrink or will it stay the same? Does everybody understand kind of the expectation of what you need to know here? All right, then let's do some practice. I'll write those concentrations again. And this is for IV solution. Either one of those solutions, they're isotonic. What we need to figure out for each of these examples is if we put a red blood cell in each of these solutions, what's going to happen to it? Which means we need to figure out, is it isotonic, hypotonic, or hypertonic? And then what happens after that? So I'll give you a minute to read through these and think them through. And then I'll go through and ask you for the answers one by one. So I'll check back in in about a minute. So what we'll do for each of these is we'll assign whether or not the solution is isotonic, hypotonic, or hypertonic. And then we'll decide what's going to happen to the red blood cell. So for number one, we have a 5% glucose solution. Iso, hypo, or hyper. It's isotonic. So what's going to happen to the red, red blood cell? Not No change? I should say no change. Undergo hemolysis or crenation, A, B, or C. Yeah, you can just put A, B, or C, too. So no change for that one. What about number two? 1% glucose solution. Iso, hypo, or hyper? And it's hypo. It's below the 5%. So what will happen to that red blood cell? A, B, or C? If it's hypo, then that means you're going to have more water flow into the cell. The cell is going to swell and burst. That's B. Lysis means burst. So remember, when we're doing these, we're comparing these percentages to the percentage of glucose or sodium chloride that you would find in an isotonic solution for an IV. So if it's above or below the 5%, above or below the 0.9%, that's how we're finding these. 
What about number three? We've got 0.5% sodium chloride solution. Iso, hypo, or hyper. Yeah, we got hypo right here, because it's below. So that's again, it's going to be the same thing as in number two. The cell is going to swell and burst. What about four? We've got 2% sodium chloride solution. It's hyper. So what will happen, A, B, or C? Crenation. That red blood cell is going to try to push out water and then it's going to shrink and that's bad news. So these are the types of questions you'll have on your exam. Again, know those percentages because you will not be given those percentages. Those of you who were participating, it seemed like you were getting it, but it'll take some practice. And we can do some more practice next week when we're doing exam review. So if you're not getting it now, we'll do some review next week. All right. So that finishes out Chapter 9. Now we're going to move on to Chapter 11, where we're going to do some sections and talk about acids and bases. We're going to start with section 11.4, the dissociation of weak acids and weak bases. As a reminder, we kind of already talked about this when we talked about weak electrolytes in chapter 9. So some of this will be pseudo-review, if you remember chapter 9 from last week. And then we're going to add on some new concepts. So we're talking about weak acids versus strong acids. A strong acid is an example of a strong electrolyte. So it will pretty much fully dissociate in water. Weak acids, however, and weak bases only partially dissociate. So we make some ions, but we also still have undissociated weak acid or weak base molecules. So we were doing these um, last week, writing these equations. We're going to write them a little bit differently when it comes to writing a dissociation equation of a weak acid or weak base for chapter 11. So this here is formic acid. It's a weak acid. And this time we're writing water as a reactant because we're making the hydronium ion and we're making the formate ion. So the water is kind of participating in this equation. Hydronium, the other way to write that is just kind of H+, plus, which you may have seen, but H3O+, plus is the more appropriate way to write it because that's what it actually is. So when you have a weak acid or a weak base and you add water, you're going to take the hydrogen from that acid and add it on to the water. So water is usually H2O, hydronium is H3O, and it is positively charged. You also make the formate ion, CHO2-. So we're going to have some practice with writing these. 
but this is the basic formula for a weak acid dissociating in water. Does this make sense? And we're going to do some practice. If it's like, yeah, I think I can follow you, let me know. If you need me to go back over it again, let me know that too. For chapter 11, we're going to do a lot of concepts to kind of build and not do as many of the questions because we need to build a lot of concepts before we can do practice questions. So again, we're going to focus on practice questions next week. And I promise you there will be a chapter 11 video that you can go to that's, you know, just the pre-recorded, listen at your leisure, run it back however many times you want type of video. So, from that equation, which this is the same equation from that previous slide, we can write what's called a dissociation expression. And this talks about the concentration of the products versus the concentration of the reactants. The value that we get when we look at the ratio of the products versus the reactants is called the acid dissociation constant or the Ka. Water isn't included in this because it's a pure liquid so we take that out of the equation. So that's not included. But If you remember from chapter 7, we have the reactant side and the product side. We write all of the ions that are products on top and the reactants on the bottom. Again, only the things that are aqueous, not the pure liquids like water. And we're going to do a practice for this. So I'll show you what I mean. That Ka value, which I'll write the one that we had for formic acid, this value, when it's very small, the equilibrium lies to the left, which means that you're going to favor the reactants. What that really means is you have a lot of undissociated acid or base. In this case, it's acid because it's a Ka. If you have a large Ka, then you have lots of products. The equilibrium lies to the right, which means you've got lots of ions in solution. Things that have a small Ka, weak acids. Things that have a large Ka, strong acids. Are you still with me? Because there's a lot of information here and we haven't asked a question yet. So let me know if you're still with me. We can always go back over it. And if you feel like you need to kind of sit back and take it in, that's cool too. Go for it, Jordan. What's your question? Can you say that last part again? Uh, 
undissociated means so if we have our formic acid example it would mean that you would have a lot of this the formic acid okay and just to carry that through because I'm sure somebody else has the same question a large Ka would mean that you'd have a lot of hydronium and whatever other ions okay it's the same type of thing for the base dissociation constant the KB so if it's small it's a weak base if it's large it's a strong base and you write the KB the same way as you write the KA you eliminate all the things that are pure liquids like water you write your products over your reactants and I should mention these are concentrations so we can do math here we're just not there yet but we can do math here to figure out concentrations of each of these different ions in solution there's a table here of weak acids and weak bases and their Ka or Kb values and that kinda gives you some perspective on some of the different acids and bases you may run into in terms of chemistry um, or biochemistry so biochemistry you'll see phosphoric acid a lot um, for reasons that we'll talk about a little bit later you'll also see carbonic acid in terms of biochemistry so this table is for your reference table 11.5 I think is a good one to put in your notebook because it summarizes the characteristics of strong acids and weak acids strong bases and weak bases it talks about the Ka whether it's going to be big or small all those kinds of things so this table right here will be very helpful to you I suggest that you put it in your notebook now we're at a learning check and I'll kind of walk you through this one so that you understand and then we'll do some examples next week so we have to write the acid dissociation expression for nitrous acid nitrous acid is a weak acid we don't write dissociation expressions for strong acids because there isn't one so that means we have to write something that looks like this the Ka is equal to some stuff over some stuff okay how do we fill in these things first we have to write what happens in water remember that this is an equilibrium so you've got the forward and backwards arrow you form the hydronium ion and you form what's called the conjugate base so what happens to that acid when it loses a hydrogen that's what you write on the other side when the water gains a hydrogen you write the hydronium does that make sense so far now that we have this equation 
And this is the same thing for every weak acid. You have your weak acid, it loses a hydrogen, that's what you write on the other side. You have your water, it gains a hydrogen, you write hydronium on the other side. So this is for weak acids in general, that's how you do it. Now we need to write our dissociation expression. So what we just wrote is an equation. Now we need to write the expression. So it's always the products over the reactants. Our products are hydronium and the conjugate base. The only reactant we're including here is the weak acid. We do not include pure liquids. So remember that. So this is the dissociation expression. So you can't really write the expression without first writing the equation. Yes, what's your question? So you don't include the water because it has a constant concentration. What we're interested in is the things that can change concentration. And that's only going to be the ions. And that's based on how much is dissolved, how much is dissociated. Just water. We're not going to see anything else. You're welcome. And I know this is kind of abstract, but this stuff is definitely important if you're going to be taking Chem 105 after 104. So chapter six that we did and kind of this stuff that we're doing here, these things are going to be essential for you and your success in Chem 105. Just throwing that out there for all of the nursing folks. We'll do some examples next week. I want to make sure that we get through the material. So does this at least sort of make sense? Do you feel like if you saw it again, that maybe you could do a little better? Or if you watched like a, another lecture, that it would make some more sense? Just want to get you in a place where it's like, I think this makes some little bit of sense. I'm trying to build here. Okay. Good. From here, we're going to build on this dissociation expression. So if it doesn't make sense, it's going to be struggle. So we talked about weak acids and bases. Now we have to talk about water. Water is amazing, okay? Wonderful, wonderful solvent. It's polar. It can do a lot of things. The other th one of the other things it can do is it can act as both an acid and a base. That's called being amphoteric. It can act as an acid or a base. Water's just amazing. So if you have a glass of water, in that glass of water, what's happening at a very low level, but it's still present, is you have hydrogens transferred from one hydrogen from one water molecule to another. So one water molecule is acting as an acid, and the other one is acting as a base. An acid is something that can donate a hydrogen. A base is something that can accept 
a hydrogen. And water can do both. There's an equilibrium that's reached between what's called conjugate acid-base pairs. What the heck does that mean? Let's say that we've got our water that is donating a hydrogen here. So this one is our acid. Just like before where I said, okay, the acid is going to lose a hydrogen. And it forms this base here. That's a conjugate acid-base pair. You start off as an acid, and then you end up as a conjugate base. If you start off as a base, then you're going to gain a hydrogen. And then you end up as an acid. You will have to identify a kind of conjugate acid base pairs. With water, it's kind of hard because it's two water molecules, right? But it's a little bit easier when you have an acid and a base that are different. But the key here to understand is the acid loses a hydrogen and becomes a conjugate base. The base on the reactant side gains a hydrogen and becomes a conjugate acid. Let me know if that makes sense. If you're seeing that, then your internet might be a little bit weak. And sometimes it can be fixed just by um, exiting and re-entering the room. All right, conjugate acids and bases. Does that make sense, the acid-base pairs? If not, we can go over it again. And I can use a slightly different example. Yes, Jordan, what's your question? Sure, absolutely. You're welcome. So I'll do that. I'll give you the concept of the conjugate acid base pair with a different example. Because with water, it's a little bit harder to see sometimes. We'll use our formic acid example. On the reactant side, we've got formic acid. That's our acid. It's the thing that can donate a hydrogen. The water, in this case, is a base because it can accept a hydrogen. And you always have to have an acid and a base. When that acid loses a hydrogen, it forms this negative ion. It's called the conjugate base. When the water gains that hydrogen, it becomes a conjugate acid. These two, the red, the two um, molecules that are connected by the red, and the two molecules correct connected by the green, those are conjugate acid-base pairs. You take an acid, it loses a hydrogen, becomes a base. You take a base, it gains a hydrogen, it becomes an acid. 
Is that a little bit clearer? You're welcome. So let's keep that in mind as we move forward. In pure water, the concentration of the hydronium and the hydroxide ions are each 1.7, 1 times 10 to the minus 7. So if we were to write a dissociation constant for water, which is called the KW, we would only include these two ions, the hydronium and the hydroxide because water is a liquid at constant concentration. When you multiply those two things together, the KW is 1 times 10 to the minus 14 at 25 degrees Celsius. So it, it's different at different temperatures. This is something that will be very helpful because when we are calculating how much hydronium or how much hydroxide to eventually calculate pH, we can use the KW of water. So this is definitely something that you want to have in your notes. This equation here and what it equals. And I'm writing it again for clarity's sake. So concentration is omitted, so you don't see any units for the dissociation constant. But this is absolutely something you want to know. Does everybody have that? We ready to move on from this slide? Okay. When the amount of hydronium and hydroxide are equal, the solution is neutral. And we're going to talk about other ways to define a solution is neutral, acidic, and basic, but this is the first one. When you have more hydronium than hydroxide, then you have an acidic solution. So that's a greater than sign going towards the hydronium. If hydroxide is greater, then the solution is basic. So keep those definitions in the back of your head. Definitely something to note. And I would recommend after going through chapter 11, make a table for yourself in your notes of the different ways that you can define a solution as neutral, acidic, or basic. Because we're gonna go over a few more things as we continue to build on these concepts. So how can we use the KW? We can use it to calculate hydronium and hydroxide concentrations in a solution. So if we know one of these concentrations, either the hydronium or the hydroxide, then we can use that along with the KW to calculate the other ion. So let's do that. What is the hydronium concentration of a solution if the hydroxide concentration is 5 times 10 to the minus 8th molar. We're assuming that it's at 25 degrees, 
because we don't have any other numbers. This is the equation that we start with. We know the solution has a concentration of 5.0 times 10 to the minus 8th molar for the hydroxide. We don't know the concentration of the hydronium and we know the Kw of water. Take a second and try to solve this. You're solving for the concentration of the hydronium ion. So rearrange the equation to solve for that, then plug in your numbers and see what you get. I'll give you two minutes to start that, and then I'll start writing it out. I'm going to start writing it out here. Did anybody get an answer? And let's walk it through. So we're starting with the Kw equals the hydronium concentration times the hydroxide concentration. That's this equation here. On the side, I wrote out the things we know, the things we don't know. We're given the concentration of hydroxide in the, in the problem. We're asked to solve for the hydronium. We know that the Kw is 1.0 times 10 to the minus 14. We can rearrange the Kw, the, dis the water dissociation equation, to solve for hydronium. And the way you do that is you divide both sides by this hydronium. So your exponent is off. So you'll need to do a refresher on how to use your calculator and put it in. You should get 2.0 times 10 to the minus 7. Talk to me about where you got stuck. Was it at rearranging the equation? putting it into the calculator. Where was the problem? Do we need to go through this one again? Okay, calculator. So if we were given the hydronium concentration and we need to figure out the hydroxide, it'd be the same thing, only you'd rearrange the equation a little bit differently. But this is this is as complex as this type of problem will get. Okay. 
So I think this is a good time for a break because we've been going for about an hour and a half. And um, if you guys remember last week, I was not Dr. Hefner, but Mama Hefner. So I'm going to need to take a little bit of a lengthier break. We're going to need to do 20 minutes instead of the normal like 5 or 10. Don't everybody complain at once, I know. So hopefully we will be able to get through the rest of what we need to do for Chapter 11. But um, if we don't, we'll finish it up. I'll give you that Chapter 11 video on YouTube. And you'll be good to go for your exam next week. So let's take 20 minutes. So I'll see you back then. Hey everybody, it's 1247. We're going to get back to it. I may need an additional few minutes before our time is up. But we're going to try to get through. So we talked about hydronium and hydroxide ions and how if you have more hydronium, it's acidic, more hydroxide, it's basic. This is just another way of visualizing that. So pure water is neutral. The concentration of hydronium and hydroxide are the same. If you add an acid, then you increase the hydronium, which decreases the hydroxide, and you have an acidic solution. The opposite happens if you add a base. Uh-oh. So that extra time I was talking about I might need it, so I apologize. We need to take an additional 10 minutes and we'll restart at one o'clock. All right. So you should get a small number here. We're talking about very small concentrations, negative two, negative three, negative five. So if you got something big, yes, it should be that. So if we're writing that in um, scientific notation, so that's what you should get. And remember, this translates to two significant figures in the hydronium concentration. Just realized my mic wasn't on. I apologize for that, so I'm going to say that over again. You should get something small, like to the minus fourth, minus fifth, minus two. It shouldn't be a positive number for your for your exponent. We're talking about very small concentrations here. Typically speaking, you're going to write that concentration in scientific notation. And keep in mind the number of significant figures. So when you look at the pH, the number of decimal places after the decimal tells you how many significant figures to put in your concentration. There's two digits after the decimal in the pH. So we have two sig figs in our concentration. Again, not a difficult calculation. You just have to know how to use your calculator. So make sure that you know how to do that and go back to it. Ah, yeah, the negative will make all the difference. So make sure you can get those answers. You can always go back, and we'll do practice next week. 
So in the interest of time, we're going to go on. We're going to try to fit in buffers. This is the last section. This is literally the last section of the last chapter that you will ever have for Chem 104. So almost there. We're going to put our knowledge of pH to use for buffers. So I should define a buffer for you. I'm a biochemist. Buffers are something that just are ingrained in my spirit, in my very soul. So I apologize if I skip through it like we're all experts here. We're not. So a buffer is a solution that maintains a particular pH by neutralizing small amounts of acid or base that are added to it. When you add acid or a base to just plain water, the pH is going to be all over the place. You add a couple of drops of acid, and now that water goes from a pH of 7 to a pH of 4. You add some base to plain water, you go from 7 to 10, right? It's very, very drastic, very, very quick. In a buffered solution, the pH is maintained. So if the pH of the buffer is 7, and you add in a little bit of acid or a little bit of base, it's not really going to change. The key here, though, is a little bit. If you add a liter of a strong acid, it's absolutely going to change the pH. But we're talking about taking a few drops here, a few drops there. No harm done. Buffers work because they can resist the change in pH from an acid or a base. And they're so important for the body because they absorb the uh, hydronium and hydroxide ions from foods and all the cellular processes, all the chemistry that's going on in your body. So you have to maintain your pH. That's why buffers are so important in biological systems. It's also really important in maintaining the proper pH for blood. And we're going to talk about that at the end of this section. So the pH for blood is around 7.4. And if that changes too drastically, then you can become very, very ill. What does a buffer contain? It has a combination of an acid-base conjugate pair. So a weak acid plus a salt. We're going to use acetic acid as our example. So that's C2H3O2. If we add water to that, we'd get some partial dissociation. So when that acid loses a hydrogen, it becomes the conjugate base. And that's what you have in solution for your buffer. The weak acid. And this is also called a salt. So you can get sodium acetate or something like that that will dissolve and create the conjugate base in solution. A buffer can contain equal concentrations of weak acid and salt, but you can vary that concentration too. So is everybody clear on what a buffer contains? The weak acid and the conjugate base. Let me know if you're still with me. Okay. So I talked about this already on the other slide. I kind of wrote it out for you. But this is here if you like kind of the 
all of the words written out for you. I'm talking about how much of each thing you've got a large amount of the weak acid, large amount of that conjugate base, and that is what helps to buffer, okay? Now what happens when you add a small amount of acid or base? Let's say that we still have our acetic acid solution and we add a little bit of base. Well, if we add a little bit of base, it's going to interact with the acid. It's going to take an acid away, or it's going to take a hydrogen away from the acid. So we're going to decrease the amount of weak acid that we have a little bit and increase the amount of conjugate base a little bit. But our pH is not going to change very much. If we add an acid, then that acid is going to interact with the conjugate base. The conjugate base will accept the hydrogen from the added acid, and then we'll have a shift in the equilibrium again, and this time we'll increase the weak acid and decrease the conjugate base. talk to me about this concept. I know we're coming up on time, so we're probably going to end it here. But does this concept make sense of how a buffer works? You can accept hydrogens, you can accept hydroniums, or excuse me, hydroxides. If it's a little bit unclear because we're going a little fast, that's okay. We can finish it up next time and start with some examples of how buffers work. So let me know how this feels, and that will dictate how we start next week. Does it make sense? A little shaky? Let me know. Yeah, we'll start here. So we'll start with 11.8. And then we'll end with some exam review. It won't take us very long to do 11.8. We were quite close to being done. But can't fit it all in. So here's your reminders. So I'm going to change this date for your Master in Chemistry because we didn't finish. So that will be November 22nd, which is after your exam. November 17th. We'll do some, so we won't have time to do final exam review there. That's a lie. We are going to cover some new material, but not much. Didn't mean a lot to you guys. Sometimes you just don't get through. Your exam is going to be next week, November 18th through the 20th. So that's Wednesday through Friday. As usual, take it through uh, Respondus. We'll go over some examples and things like that. If you have questions, bring them to class. You have a final exam, December 8th, and that has a time slot. Normally we give you that, you know, the window of time to do it. For your final exam, you have to start at December 8th, which is a Tuesday, somewhere between 11 a.m. and, two p or and 1 p.m., and you'll get two hours to finish your final. So we'll talk about that again next week, and we'll talk about um, setting up time, office hours, between the end of classes and the final exam next week. That's all I have for you. If you don't have any questions, you're free to go. Otherwise, you can stick around and ask your questions, but I do teach at 2 o'clock. So, have a good one. Stay safe.